If we're to like boil down, why does it every year we come to the legislature, we do these events, we send packages to the MLAs is because we want politicians to recognize that when they're crafting legislation, even if they don't necessarily think it's going to affect us, but it might affect us, we need to be consulted as trans people to make sure that if, if we see something that these politicians who don't have our lived experience miss, that we can point that out and say, look, this is going to potentially impact our community in a way that is not positive. There's an initiative that we tried to do where we asked all of the MLAs to take the trans flag that we'd given them in the package, speak to one of their constituents, give them the trans flag, and then report back what they learned about their region and how trans people experience that region. We got a lot of pushback from that. We had MLAs saying, well, I don't know how to find a trans person. Or we had people saying, I don't want to let you know what issues exist because of privacy issues, which we're not asking for right. personal information or anything like that. But it seemed like a lot of the pushback was just because they didn't know how to respond. They didn't have a trans person to talk to. And so there was some sort of excuse as to why they weren't going to do that. And I think that's a big problem. If any politician doesn't know a trans person and they're trying to put forward legislation that affects us, that's a big problem. When you're looking at me, we talk about trans visibility. What trans visibility means is that I lost my career in my mid fifties. I had to expend all my life savings to live to the point where I could then finally collect reduced pensions that, that I'm now subsisting on. That's what trans visibility looks like to me, right? It looks like $2 million of lifetime income. I never have it a chance to occur, right? And I'm on a path of marginalization from then on. It's, it's not understood, but it's a lifelong condition. I'm 68, okay? I'll die trans, okay? It doesn't get fixed, do you understand? The system wants to take a person in, process them, spit them out, basically. What does it take, right? What does it take? I mean, is there such a plethora of trans elders that are showing up here yearly all the time that somehow I missed that boat? Is there consultation going on with our community all over the province that somehow, even though we're like one of the larger organizations that represents our community, we didn't hear about it? I mean, what is the truth that's going on here? If we actually say there's some problems, then we don't get any more emails. That's the easiest way to deal with advocates is just cut them out of the process, right? The truth that's going on here is that we're just not worth the votes. Do you understand? We're like 1% of the population at any given time, and it's just not worth it. We're better off with opposition parties, always. Always have been. When we were doing the petitions with Spencer, when they were in the opposition, that's when we saw some movement, that's when we got some things done. Our specific recommendation is that they just reconvene the 2015 Recommendations Committee and do an evaluation. It's seven years past since they started. It's a reasonable evaluation period. Why can't we do those things? The other part of our petition asks that, just like they did for the Black community last year, they create a convenior position for Resilience BC for the trans community, right? We need some facilitation in that role. In the original Transcare Business Plan, what was supposed to happen was that there was supposed to be a province-wide engagement with the communities. They were supposed to identify service providers that were providing peer support services throughout the province. They were supposed to come up with an overall network and then come into a common training program to provide support across the province, right, so that there was a standard applied to it. I don't know, do you see anything like that? I, there's nothing like that. There's nothing at all. I lived 34 years as a man and finally said, enough is enough, I'm coming out. I'm being truthful to who I am. Went through the processes, started going to hormones, and everything else, living life as a female, long hair, the whole works. Gender reassignment surgery on September 11th, 2018. Here I am sitting on the plane to come home, and WestJet looked at me and said, you're not flying, you're, you're not safe to fly. I wasn't in the best condition. I was having a reaction to something I didn't know what. I spent the next night and a half at the local hospital in Montreal where they had no idea how to deal with someone like myself. The doctor, as much as she's like, I want to help you, but she goes, I've never seen someone like yourself before. I don't know what to do. They had been talking to Dr. Broussard, in, in, who did the surgery, and eventually he finally reneged Saturday and said, fine, get me over to him. And so he took a five second look at me and said, get on the plane, go home. Sunday, I flew home, went and saw my doctor up in Comox on Monday. She's like, something's not right here. I don't know what, go home, I'll call, call you soon. And by Wednesday, I had a massive hemorrhage and lost 50% of my blood and blood out around the house. My daughter thankfully didn't find me, who was two years old at the time, but I woke up with a paramedic leaning over me while I was in the shower. I spent four days in the Kemper River Hospital with no aid to any of my tools or anything else I needed. Lost probably 75% of my vaginal cavity while they're fighting with the doctors in Montreal trying to get me some kind of help, but no real communication. 
Eventually I saw the debrief that came out of all of this. There was like a one paragraph little note that was written from Montreal. And that was all that was sent as my discharge notice. Things are a little bit different now. Like Dr. General is out here. I don't know how different things would have been had she been fully up and practicing. But I was basically sent home to that. Less I mean, than 10 years ago, if you wanted to go down this road, you were, you went and saw a doctor who, and if the doctor believed you and took your kind of word, you got assigned to a counselor and typically they were in Vancouver. And you spent two years going over to Vancouver every month for two years, hearing all the appointments. And Chris and I have a friend who has a transgender son who had to endure dealing with her period, breast development, all these things that they never wanted. They wanted to be a man. And like the last appointment, the counselor pulled the mom aside and said, look, I knew you had a son from the beginning, but I had to have them back here every month for 24 appointments before I could even give them a prescription for hormones. And she's like, you bastard, you put my kid through how much? Now you've got to go through breast reductions and removals and mastectomies and, and then like the, the hysterectomy and all the things that follow when a lot of it could have been saved off and not had to go through. When I went to see therapist and they're sort of evaluating me to see if I can get on hormones or have surgeries or whatever it is, there was a requirement that I had spent a year leading up to whatever decision it was presenting myself as a woman. But there's no definition of how a woman is supposed to present themselves. The person I was dealing with was great. And I said, I've been wearing women's clothes because I'm a woman and I'm wearing clothes. But there were other therapists who would say, well, you don't wear enough dresses and so I'm not going to approve you. And it really was dependent on which therapist you saw, whether or not you were going to get the care that you needed. So, I didn't get any of that stuff by contrast. Mm -hmm. It was just like, okay, here's the hormones, come back a year yeah. later. You know, right. Mm -hmm. green so, light for surgery. Okay, we'll see the next guy. Surgery. Okay, yep, yeah, bye. You look at me today and you wonder what's going on. Like I, I've spent three years working on the road doing traffic control and got bullied, harassed to the point where I've had to go into hiding. I've spent the last two years off the road now because I'm scared of motorbikes because I was threatened by the Hells Angels from one of the guys I was working with. I'm in hiding. I'm presenting as, as, a, as a sort of a man because I can't look like a woman anymore. But yet my body structure between having a vagina to a bit of boob structure and everything else, I'm somewhere lost in the world and I'm in hiding and WorkSafe has finally just finished my latest psychological assessment to prove I've got PTSD from everything that's gone on. I'm happy to give the time and share my experiences with people. I'll help, I'll stand up in the, the goddamn legislature, I don't care. I'll tell the world how it is. And if they want to hear it, and even if they don't want to hear it, here's the stories. This is what's going on out there. Not even six months ago, my hair was halfway down my back. I didn't have facial hair. You know, two years ago, I was dressing full time as a, as, a, as a woman, living my life authentically. And now I'm back looking like this. If people don't think people like us are going to be interned in camps somewhere in North America within five years, they're not reading the news. That's where we're headed. We're the first people rounded up in any circumstances. When we did our facilitator training last year, we called it camp survival skills, right? Because when we end up in camps, we're the first to go. That's the reality of what we're teaching people these days, okay? And if people don't think that's what we're dealing with on the, at this level, that's what we're dealing with, right? But why, why, do we, why do we continue to support these gender roles that are just so toxic? Kill men early, right? Subjugate women for their lives. Why do we accept this? That that force to resist it on an ongoing basis takes like constant effort. Mm -hmm. You know how it is, you're in government, right? You know what it's like, right? The more you stand forward, the more you're sat on. I think that's been noticeable in the Green Party itself, stepping from Andrew Weaver to Sonia Fersenau. It seemed like Sonia had a lot more to overcome than Andrew did in terms of getting respect from the public. It's not past tense, I think. Uh, She's not charismatic enough. She doesn't smile enough. Why does she wear makeup? Yeah, we're always a little more disappointed when the woman in the room doesn't stand up for either herself or the other woman or the women's issue. We will once again proudly raise the trans flag on the lawn of the BC legislature as the first government in BC history to do so. This is a gesture to our trans friends, neighbors, family, and community members that we see you, we hear you, and we are here for you. It's essential for BC to be a province that recognizes and respects people for who they are, attempts to erase the existence of trans people, and to block their participation in society is the basis for transphobic discrimination and too often, violence. We're here to uh, recognize, to celebrate, 
best in the day of this world. It was started in 2009 by Rachel Cranmer. And it was started because we need to recognize transgender people in all aspects of our lives. If you pay attention to the media, what you see and hear most often is all the terrible things that happen to transgender people. You hear about risk, you hear about violence, you hear about abuse, you hear about mental health issues. Certainly today, we're hearing a tremendous amount about the attacks on the rights of transgender people, the very existence of transgender people that are taking place in the United States. And Transgender Day of Visibility is a very important time to draw our attention away from all of the abuse, all of the horrors, and to recognize that transgender people have made huge contributions to society. We are valuable members of society. And Transgender Day of Visibility is a time for hope, it's a time to look to the future, to recognize resilience, to recognize strength, to recognize success, and to understand that trans people can and do thrive. Transgender and gender diverse people have been here forever. So today is a day of visibility, but it's also a recognition that they've long been here and now we're only as a society, as a culture, as a law, as a parliament, catching up with the existence of people we are supposed to serve, work with in this building together and should have been for as long as society exists. But indeed, hate and othering and those kinds of issues do come in, do divide, and unfortunately leaves us all weaker. So it gives me great hope to see us here today to talk about the visibility of gender identity, of gender expression, to talk about the Although it's not in the title, I would say the audibility. It's not just enough to see that transgender and gender diverse people are here, but we have to hear them. We have to involve them. They need to be here as leaders. And I think uh, that's why I'm excited to be here today as a celebration of how far we've come and a recognition that we can do so much more. I prefer to be called Honorable Speaker, not Mr. Speaker, because I think it's a role. It's not a gendered role, but it's a role of honor and trust, and I thank my colleagues for putting me in that deputy speaker position. But I wear this uniform today as a way to say to all gender diverse and transgender people, this is a place for you too. And I do that on behalf of all of us, and I believe I have that support of all of us to say that. This is a place for you. This is a province for you. So while there may be other places in the world, and even places within BC where sometimes it doesn't feel so safe, it should feel safe, and we need to work together to make it safe to recognize you, to love you, and to celebrate you. This is your home too. And I think it's an incredible privilege to stand here today on Trans Day of Visibility and to actually want to be seen for who I am, to want to be seen as a transgender person. I know that my visibility is hard won by transgender people that came before me, that fought for my rights and freedoms and for my recognition. And I also know that it's a privilege that I get because I have a family that is loving I have a community that is caring, and I have a workplace that's inclusive. On Trans Day Visibility, I want you to think about what it means to be visible, because I think that being seen is a bit more than service level. I think that being seen is about being understood as a whole person, to be understood as someone with an intersectional identity, as somebody that has complex aspirations, as someone that has loving relationships and is deserving of love. And more than that, I think it's really important to know that visibility is not the end goal. Visibility is more like a means to an end. It's a tool that we use. I want politicians to see me and then to talk to me about what kinds of policies and funding structures would make for a more equitable society. I want CEOs and executive directors to see me and then to talk to trans people about what would make their workplace more inclusive. I want doctors and nurses to see me and to think about what would make a more inclusive medical practice. I want parents to see me and to know that visibility is only come by through acceptance and through love. And I want youth to see me and to know that a life that is authentic and that is full is entirely possible for a transgender person. It is undisputed that transgender people face disproportionate harms. We face transphobia, assault, exclusion, microaggressions. We disproportionately face racism, sexism, ableism, 
but let Transgender Day of Visibility be the start of a conversation of how we face these injustices and how we change perspectives and systems that refuse to let trans people thrive. I'd like to invite our stage party to raise the transgender flag. First of all, it's a, it's a shame that we have to uh, bring awareness uh, because it should be that we just naturally are inclusive, that we're respectful, that, uh, that, that we work together and recognize uh, trans uh, just like uh, everyone. It's uh, my job as a legislator to uh, do what I can to recognize, uh, whether it's through policy, through legislation, uh, through the work that uh, I do in the legislature, uh, to draw attention uh, to the issues that trans people face day in and day out, uh, the struggles that they face, the violence that happens uh, just because they're them, they're who they are, and that's not acceptable. It's an important day for uh, a society that is striving to be more inclusive, to embrace the diversity uh, that, that exists in our society, and it's days like this, it's the opportunity to raise the flag, it's the opportunity uh, here in the legislature to bring together policymakers to ensure that the laws and the policies that we're making are reflecting where our society should be, where it needs to be, and where it needs to go. And so, you know, I would say that these uh, days of advocacy are really important from a, a legislative perspective, but for me personally, it's also an important reminder uh, where I can improve and where I can be a, a better person, a better father, a better partner.